no one should be really scared of the music theory. It's like actually once you get to ground logic of it, it gives you so much uh, new possibilities and it would feel like you had a problem with your eyes and all of a sudden you put a yeah. glasses yeah. on and you realize that how, uh, yeah. how bad you were seeing. What's up? Felix Flair here for Thoman and uh, today my guest is uh, the one and only Hussein Evergen, also known as Magna Pia. He is a music producer and composer, working as a solo artist but also as part of the infamous techno duo Kassegrain. Um, and he has released music on labels such as Zoma, Prologue and his own label Arking Seas as well. And he's also a very well-trained classical composer and teacher of music theory, which is why you are here today to uh, yeah, give us a little introduction um, for some of the basic concepts of music theory from the eyes uh, of an electronic musician. Yeah, thanks for asking me to come here. Yeah, basically I was uh, trained as a um, classical pianist when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I studied um, composition quite a while, quite a long time, so like about like 10 years of university study. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Istanbul, then I went to Salzburg Mozarteum in yeah. Austria, mm -hmm. where I was basically like mainly, uh, mainly working on composition and piano, but also a lot of uh, conducting or music theory on site. Yeah. Of course, like music theory has to be the, the basic of the whole composition study and also a lot of musical pedagogy and I've been like teaching uh, for 25 years um, piano and music theory to you know very, more like a conventional sense mm. and then I was like uh, more into the um, techno scene uh, you know like a but more like making dance music. Uh, when I was 25, I kind of got into that. Yeah. And um, as you said, quite that actually led my way into, into a whole another world. Um, so I kind of stopped um, teaching for 10 years in between. Mm -hmm. And last year I was thinking like what I could, I could do actually with that. And so basically there are not so many people I guess who are coming from classical music but active uh, active um, artists in any kind of dance music scene. I mean there are of course for, for sure some people but um, are, like not so many in any case. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me it was like more the idea like what, what uh, could I teach um, to the people who produce music. Yeah. Um, Either in their studios or in their um, in their home studio, in their in their bedroom studio. So basically, um, in in electronic music scene, it is a thing that mostly the artists do not have the background of certain yeah. basics. Yeah, you can at least theory. get very very far without yeah, yeah. touching on music theory, especially yeah. in the more like the sound designish, uh, abstract electronic music world. You can. Of course. Basically uh, work your whole career uh -huh. without touching on music theory, but I thought it would maybe be interesting to hear from you how music theory can enhance even those more experimental, not so yeah. classical uh, approaches. So yeah, what's, uh, maybe let's just start with one of the first concepts that you uh, yeah, think are most um, essential uh, to get started. Yeah, basically what, um, first of all, like just uh, as you said, it is quite easy to, to get something done. Mm. Um, quite uh, like just if you just turn the knobs, basically you get some sound out. And the um, the idea of harmony, like when you look at the 80s house music or techno music, basically, mm. um, you would have maybe a, a synthesizer with three oscillators, mm. and one like just by the pitching the oscillator, one you would do like when you're on a C. Mm. This is the note C. And uh, when you just like keep one uh, one oscillator on zero and one oscillator on plus three, um, and this way you would build chords and then and exactly this is basically um, so when you when you when you play when you play something like that with one finger basically mm -hmm. yeah um, so with the with the oscillators three oscillators like um, pitched differently from each other yeah you would play a chord progression essentially. 
-hmm. So this is basically the level of um, uh, basic music theory for, for lots of lots of uh, dance music producers. Yeah, yeah, I think because yeah. uh, I, for example, have the Wall of Pulse 2, mm -hmm. which is a, a mono synth, but it has three oscillators, and that's also a technique that I use exactly. if I want yeah, to play yeah. a chord with them. Exactly. I have to uh, yeah, detune uh, two of the oscillators, uh -huh. uh, but then you're of course also yeah stuck to one very yeah, specific yeah. chord that yeah, you can when just you have, when you have, pose, Yeah, when you have house music, like you would add maybe a seventh chord. Yeah. Like. So basically always the same chord, just transposed. Mm -hmm. So this was like, more um, more or less level of a lot of people have uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to music theory. Yeah. But I just told like, it's basically like the, the, everyone has a keyboard in front of them yeah. on a synthesizer, but very few people would know like what to do with it. And there are lots of YouTube videos, like which is like just this one, but um, it, they're always like in a way just giving some uh, little tips and little tricks how to how to get into a quite conventional uh, result, mm -hmm. and not nothing gets really nothing gets really deep in the in yeah. thing. So this is uh, what I started uh, teaching people basically. Like, yeah, in your one-on-one -on -one courses that you. Yeah, one of my courses they they were like sometimes really really uh, successful musicians mm -hmm. and producers who maybe. Uh, are sick of um, like touring for many years and they want to go to direction of um, um, like film music or something like that in the future. Yeah. So they would like to know about the harmony and sometimes it will be just some people who are really humble and uh, talented mm. and ask me if I can help them. So this is how it basically started. Yeah. And I kind of like created this um, whole a course uh, where you could get between um, like 10 to 20 lessons mm -hmm. where you could actually, you don't particularly have to play a Mozart piece or something, but mm -hmm. you could sit in front of a keyboard and you would actually improvise and make some chord progressions and actually know what you're doing. Yeah. So, and this course is basically, so it's very difficult to put it all, of course, like the short um, time now, but mm -hmm. Well, where I start is um, what is the sound? What's happening with the sound? Mm -hmm. Or what, it, what is the sound? What's happening when I play a note? It's a vibration. Mm. It's a vibration. And um, basically you have a source of sound and the vibration comes out and it's like how many times uh, it is um, repeated, mm. the, vib the vibration, the same vibration, how many times it's repeated per minute, let's say this tone is vibrating 100 times a minute. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when it's, when it's a double amount? Yeah. And the double amount yes. is an octave. Is an octave. Yeah. Basically. And everything about music theory is based on that. What happens between an octave? Mm. And this is an octave, this is an octave. And they're all like the frequency amount is exactly double of each other. And what happens, for example, what kind of uh, what kind of sounds, what kind of notes uh, inside, what kind of vibration? Because when we have when we have a clap, this is a noise. Mm -hmm. and there are lots of um, resonating sounds in one sound in a really irregular way. Yeah. But when we get kind of like a what we call a, an ideal string situation, mm -hmm. where we get the certain ratios of the vibration. Like um, when you think of a when you think of a long um, string, mm -hmm. and basically when you put when you put your finger in the middle of the string, you will get an octave higher. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when you when you when you put on a third of a string, mm -hmm. it would get even shorter, and then it would be octave plus a fifth higher, mm -hmm. which is like. And then when you when you use the quarter quarter of the of the string. Mm -hmm which will be the half of the half, again, like a double side of, size, uh, of a double size mm -hmm. with the frequency, uh, basically that would be our fourth sound, which sounds in it. So I'm talking about here, I'm talking about the harmonics, mm -hmm. the overtones, and this is uh, what we are actually all the time busy with, what, what frequency is our, is our sound. Yeah. 
And once you understand this, then you can actually see what the music theory is about. And I would say the double amount of every note mm -hmm. is just divided by 12. Yeah. And every 12 bit we call a semitone. Mm -hmm. And a semitone. That's essentially just a half step. Yeah, just a half step. In American, you would say half step, a mm -hmm. semitone in the UK. Um, so how are we dealing with this? So this is basically the Western standard, which was kind of established in the 14th century, 15th century, mm -hmm. or even before. Um, so, so actually this uh, dissection into what 12 tones is actually arbitrary in a sense. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the uh, distance between it is not so arbitrary. This is, this is actually no, just double the just frequency. Just a double, double the frequency. But to divide it in 12 tones is actually tone. just a tradition that happened over time. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. And this happened like over thousands of years, of course. When you, when you look at uh, what, is a, what is a scale, for mm -hmm. example. A scale, um, like the, a lot of musicians know, of course, what a scale is, and this is a C major scale, and that would be that would be an A major scale. Yeah. So where does this come from? Where? What's the what's the root of it? What's the um, in what culture? What happened exactly? So when you look at, for example, like the the prehistoric uh, scales, mm -hmm. they would be just like. Maybe two notes. Yeah. And everything happened. So someone yeah. would just Maybe like uh, hit some like 30,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago. Yeah. Like someone would just like hit some drum like the, from a skin and then just sing um, in a way what he or she could do. Mm -hmm. So whole music is made like after how our uh, how our voice is built. Mm -hmm. So our voice is so we can't we can't say like uh, two different uh, words at the same time. Yeah. Or we can't sing so a we chord. Are monophonic. Yeah. We are monophonic. Yeah. And uh, Even the whole. I saw this viral video of a woman who actually managed to sing a chord uh, some years ago. Which is again <laughs> the harmonics. Uh, she's <laughs> just using the harmonics, and yeah. she's actually just like uh, the Mongolians do it. Uh, the uh, the Tibetans do it, yeah. uh, the overtone singing. So it's actually just um, what uh, does a sound mm -hmm. include all those so, and so on. You so always have this fundamental frequency yeah, in a sense exactly. that that is mm -hmm. what we would call a C or a D or whatever, yeah. and then mm -hmm. in all of the sounds there's an infinite number theoretically of uh, harmonics or overtones. Exactly, and if they're regular, uh, if they're regular, uh, exactly like one to two, one to three, one to four, like this, this uh, and so on, the ratio. So it's like a math mathematical ratio. Mathematical ratio of, uh, like um, explored by uh, Pythagoras. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the basic of the whole Western music, uh, music theory. Yeah. And... Um, so for thousands of years, no single culture came up with any polyphonic music, mm -hmm. uh, except um, some cultures in o Oceanic area or some cultures in West Africa, as much as I know, like marimba-based music. Mm -hmm. But th this somehow happened to change in Europe in the late medieval times. Mm -hmm. And also in Georgia, because they have also like really folk music with the polyphonic sounds. Yeah. How this happened was, I believe that the music was practiced a lot in church, mm -hmm. uh, in the Christian, uh, like in, the, in the Christian church sense, and how the the choir was mostly was the male choir. Then somehow at some point, um, kids started singing and women started singing. So like the religious idea in West uh, was opening up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing, how the things uh, changed, yeah. uh, because all of a sudden you had people with a higher pitch, mm -hmm. which couldn't sound, which couldn't sing this note, but this note, so. And when you have a church, like Ave Maria or something, and then if there was kids or women, or like they would, 
at some point, I believe that they started adding the fifth of it, which is the second harmonic mm -hmm. on a harmonic row. So in something like... So this is how actually the polyphony in Western tradition start happening. Mm -hmm. And of course, we uh, we had less notes. Yeah. The keyboard, the design of the keyboard is a much later yeah. concept. And um, so this changed a lot, of course, when this is a, this is a result of an established um, uh, harmonic system, mm -hmm. which is again like like around the, like from 1000 to 1500. Yeah. Uh, so basically, this was a time when everything was getting established mm. in the, the music theory. Yeah. At the same time, another thing is like um, the invention of notation, like writing notes. Yeah. Because in every culture, the um, the heritage of like music, musical um, musical education was brought verbally mm -hmm. to the next generation. So there was like. Um, a master of Indian ragas, for example, he would he would teach his um, students uh, how it's supposed to be done. Mm. And but when when in Europe the notation, like writing notes, um, was invented, people started actually having a bit more overview mm. of it. So, what if I write this down and give it to those people and write this down, give it to those people and let them sing at the same time? Yeah. And this is like how the how the practice just happened and over the over the many, many years, um, uh, we kind of established uh, ourselves um, in a system called tonal system. And tonal system is based on the scales, um, basically like the, the main two ones are major and minor. Yeah. And when you have, um, as a scale is, what is a scale? A scale is, um, you have a palette, like just like a colors, yeah. uh, you have a palette of sounds, of colors, different colors. So. And you choose with uh, which color you actually paint your mm -hmm. painting. Yeah. So it's exactly the same. When you have, we have 12 notes in the Western tradition. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the prehistoric scale will be like two or three notes. Um, in the 20th century, you can talk about 12 tone music, also like atonal music, mm -hmm. and where you, your scale will be full on palette. Yeah. And, uh, but the standard way is like just to choose seven out of, uh, seven uh, notes out of 12, yeah. which are connected to each other as a half tone, half step or a whole step. A major or minor system would be like, basically just a white keys mm -hmm. uh, from C to C. Yeah. And this is our like basic, one and the and the and the formula is whole whole half whole 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 half. Yeah. And the the minor one is just exactly the same thing from A to A. Mm -hmm. And this will be uh, okay. whole half whole whole half whole whole. Oh, okay. If you if it's difficult if it's too quick to follow, yeah. what I'm doing is basically. When you look at the keyboard like that, mm -hmm. there is no, there is no difference of value. It's not like with lots of people. The scary part is like people would believe like the white keys are the real deals, mm -hmm. black <laughs> keys are the side Excellent. projects. Yeah. <laughs> but they're not. They're all equally yeah. valued basically, and every note would have two names. Mm -hmm what we call a diatonic system in, in general. So to uh, understand, like, it's very important like how you call the notes uh, in context of tonality and harmony. It's a massive difference to call this C, F sharp and C, G flat. Mm -hmm. C, F sharp um, could have a different progression and could go to this. Mm -hmm. G major. I'm 
jumping out a little bit, so like, but, but C, G flat could be, could feel like going to this direction. At the same time, like, you know those, you know those, like, um, the, the gifts, like, ballerina turning left. Mm -hmm. Is it turning left or is it turning, turning right? right. Yeah, it's so it's exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly the basic, the same thing to understand um, what is the context of a note yeah. in a whole harmonic progress. Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at uh, when you look at the cultures in um, East Asia, for example, you would you would talk about pentatonic system, which is like the the five tone scale. And like when you when you just like simply look at the keyboard, what is what is exactly here? Like what's the first five pattern you could see? Mm -hmm. Which is like two black keys and, and three black keys, and when you when you just randomly play them, you would immediately get like an East East Asian uh, mm -hmm. vibe out of it, basically. Yeah, uh, it's just like how you or blues is the same thing. Like blues would have like pentatonic, yeah. which is like five tones. I also heard scale. that Stevie Wonder especially played a lot with only the black keys because he's also blind. Ah, I did and not know A lot know of his tracks, you can you can see that he's. Uh, disproportionately using the black keys, actually. Ah, okay. I didn't know that, but it makes sense. Like it's like way uh, nicer to feel, maybe like just, yeah. um, just to because you can touch, you can have the haptic, uh, which is like just a straight thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is like? Um, so when we look at, uh, so how do we how do we approach the sounds? For example, if you go to Indonesia and look, find someone who's maybe older and he has never heard any uh, pop music or Western music in his life, yeah. uh, when you when you play the person a, a C major chord and he, he will not maybe think that it's a, it's a happy thing, yeah, because. Uh, major kind of stands for uh, happy feeling mm -hmm. and minor stands for um, more melancholic feeling. Mm -hmm. But these are actually just uh, what we were conditioned for past um, yeah. six, seven hundred years from the church music. Yeah. So when it was about yeah, okay. like um, about paradise or something, so you're like saying this, it was more like the emotional compass, emotional response to. Uh, in, in Major the, and minor keys is actually just a social construct. Just a social construct, uh, and if if it's talking about, you would use the minor keys keys in the organ uh, when you have like maybe when you're talking about the suffering of Jesus or so. Mm -hmm. And this kind of like ended up um, being the general uh, like recognition in our minds. But yeah, so it completely changed our perception. Exactly, yeah. perception. So when you know the formulas, the ones that I say like um, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, and whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole. Uh, you, can have a major, you can have major and minor um, scales based out of it. And what I was saying before, like when you close it, when you close this side, which the only thing you need to care is what comes next after each other. Mm -hmm. Each of them is called a half step yeah. or a semitone. So in this case, whatever, like when you have, when you don't know, so this is like a, this is a job for learning like about maybe like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And after that, you can actually play an A major, mm -hmm. A major scale without just like, just counting like semitone, whole tone. Mm -hmm. First whole tone, half. Second half tone, tone, half tone, whole tone, whole tone, whole tone, and a half tone. Yeah. So this way you can already actually build the scale even without knowing what notes are in it, because exactly. you understand the system without knowing what you notes could are in it. create any scale yeah. uh, you would You like. could create any scale, yeah. then it's very important to understand um, what's going on within a scale, like why are we why are we talking about like C major or what does C major mean? Mm -hmm. A piece in C major means that the C major is the note that you hear the most yeah. throughout the whole piece. Mm -hmm. And 
I believe that it's completely connected to the to the um, uh, political uh, events mm. or like political directions which we're going because like for many many years this is a very monarchic system. Mm. If you have a on C major, this mm. is your king, this is your president. Mm. But what are the others? What does every every note has a has a function? Yeah. So there's also scales that uh, have different names, but actually contain the exact same notes, right? Um, and, it's, and it depends on the context how you call them. Depends on the context. Yeah. yeah. How would you find out um, which? You can basically make your own scales. You can like do whatever you want. Uh, so what? What? I can just explain like for example how the major and minor came to do mm -hmm. like really quickly. Yeah. So when when we say um, C major scale. We have C, which we call tonic, mm -hmm. and then you have supertonic, mediant, subdominant, dominant, um, submediant, leading tone, and tonic back again. Mm -hmm. What do they mean? They are like, think about like a government. If this is the president, mm -hmm. the dominant would be um, the foreign minister. Mm -hmm. Foreign minister assisted by the leading tone. A leading tone would be always half a note lower than, than the tonic and would have a natural feeling that it would want to go to the tonic. Yeah. Because in music, the smallest, the smallest story in a music piece, we call it a phrase, mm -hmm. and the phrase could only happen like either starting point. What would be an example for a phrase? Um, I will give it immediately. Um, let's say a Mozart sonata, a very simple piece. So this, this was would be a, a Mozart song. This was two phrases. Exactly. So. Yeah. And that's one oh. phrase. So quite literally, like a sentence mm -hmm. in, in a speech. Actually. Exactly, like a sentence, like a phrase. Mm -hmm. So what happens here, what, it's just like f uh, four bars, each of them. Mm -hmm. Start on the tonic, where we hear the, like, the president, mm -hmm. so you see. Tension. How does that happen? The leading tone that I was I was talking about, which is just a half a half a note lower than the yeah, C. This is the one that wants to resolve. Wants to resolve. And this exactly. is how you create the mm -hmm. tension, and then this is how we create tension. If it's not half a tone lower, if it's like a whole tone lower, mm -hmm. let's like let's see how it would sound. You know. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly the same feeling like... Not the same dynamic. No. This doesn't sound real like it's, it feels like going there. Mm. So, um, so basically you have all the functions. Uh, as I said, like if this is your president, this would be your foreign minister assisted by the leading tone. They mostly work together. Um, and then the other ones are like other finance minister, education minister, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. So a phrase, tension, and then build up, again tonic, feeling comfortable, and then again tension. Yeah. So you can, this is like a really um, hierarchic system. So what you always have to end up is the tonic mm -hmm. in a scale. And uh, it's always like tension comes from five and seven and, uh, and the, the, the release is always on the one. And everything else is just like um, to make it more interesting. Yeah. But now we are in a corona and we are in Germany and we couldn't go to other countries for a while. So it's yeah. actually, we were all bored really. So it's good to have a system, but it's not really fun if you can't go to other yeah. places. 
So if you can't, if you can't go from one tonality to another one, mm -hmm. so this is how how like um, this is what I'm actually teaching people. Like how can you get out of the system and mm -hmm. go somewhere else? And it always happens uh, through when you want to go some to some other tonality, you would have to think of the fifth function mm -hmm. of the scale. Yeah. So once you understand the the system, the logic, uh, how it all works, then you can actually be super free about it. Yeah. And the problem, of course, like um, with the techno music or IDM or house music or whatever, mm -hmm. like all the dance music or electronic music in general, has a, a kind of like um, innovative, innovative idea. Mm -hmm. Like there is like a, the attitude of producers are mostly how I'm going to break the rules. Yeah. But... As we said, like you can like just make something sound really like good quite quick, but um, sometimes if you don't know how the rules work, it's very difficult to break them. Yeah. So this is uh, what I'm trying to like kind of uh, explain to people how how they would do. Yeah. And uh, um, so, for example, in, mm -hmm. in techno music that is more abstract and more like sound designy, what you would do, I think Dasha Rush, for example, said that you basically don't compose with no, uh, notes, but with frequencies in a more intuitive way. Of course, obviously, notes actually are the same thing as frequencies. Exactly. But, this is the but thing. Detached, notes are the frequencies. But detached no? from, mm -hmm. from this kind of grid, mm -hmm. you would, for example, uh, I don't know, use a uh, resonance and a, mm -hmm. and a cut off from, from a synth or something and tweak it until you have something that just feels right for you. Feels right for you, and exactly. Then mm -hmm. in the end you have a bunch of noises that interact in a co complex way but are mm -hmm. not like really bound to, bound to this kind of system. And I always notice that it's uh, harder to establish these sound designers, uh, unique sounds into a track when I already have a melody in it that is part of the system and is working within this tradition. Um, and then exactly. it's easier yeah. to have tracks that are completely free from it or completely bound to the system. Uh, you, can have a, you can have a track bound to the system, you can have completely free, and you, yeah. but at the end it's better to know what the system is, yeah. basically. And um, so basically there are lots of like, okay, like these are frequencies and um, they're all frequencies of course, but there is a whole, uh, there is a whole connection between how the frequencies fit to each other mm -hmm. and how they move within each other yeah. and the, the psychological recognition of that mm -hmm. and the, what the emotional results of how that happens yeah. and this is all about the um, uh, like mathematic of of the music is all about that because they're actually um, the whole system if you know what uh, to like for let's say um, this uh, this is a sixth interval mm -hmm. this is a sixth interval or this uh, this is a minor sixth this is a major sixth And when you know what actually, what kind of like historical um, meaning this had, like for example, every time if something was painful mm -hmm. in the whole classical music uh, background, this has been always the one uh, to explain the pain mm -hmm. in the music. Yeah. And or like uh, heart pain or yeah. things like that. And ah, that's, that's interesting because I often tend to do mm -hmm. when I when I for example compose like techno melodies mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. like in this kind of token kind of sire depressive kind of yeah. way. You often get a nice <laughs> get a get a get a nice result when you play with these half steps on different octaves. Half steps on different octaves, which is like a. Which is like a what we what we would call dissonant yeah. interval. Yeah. So what is dissonant? What is consonant? Mm -hmm. So um, either like um, for example in techno music um, or house music, uh, people would concentrate either on consonant sounding um, chords, or they would actually um, concentrate on the dissonant sounding chords as well, like, and this would be like more beloved by the, the techno folks, basically. Yeah. So kind of like more um, 
uh, irritating sounding sounding yeah. notes, please. But irritating sound notes doesn't mean like they would either like concentrate on those and like just keep them for a whole track, or the other ones which sounds like harmonic, yeah. basically. But they all have their functions. Basically, the irritating sound is also used for the for the tension to create tension in music. Yeah, and. and you don't really have to uh, write a symphony when mm. you when you have a music theory, but at least, like for example, to know what chords sound dissonant and consonant and how they would move towards each other, you could just like create. Um, you could have just only like two three chords in a whole track on a mm. six seven uh, minutes track, and still um, really like keep it minimalized, but still you can play with that in the sense of when you have tension, mm -hmm. how you how you arrange your song, how the storyline is going on the track. Yeah. So you can actually use a lot of that as also um, someone who doesn't want to have anything to do with the keyboard. Or, yeah. or notes. And so far we've spoken about like the this traditional Western system and mm -hmm. on the other hand breaking completely free from it and basically working without uh, any uh, specific system. But then there's also completely different systems that you can uh, that you can work with. For example, what uh, Alexi Perela is doing with the mm -hmm. Kuluni sequence, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like this, microtonal tuning. Um, how could we, for example, create our own system like, like he did? Create, create your own, like you're basically like when you look at, for example, Satie's music, mm -hmm. uh, you would see just, he just like created his whatever scale, mm -hmm. and maybe coming from some church modes or yeah. like jazz modes or something like, mm -hmm. um, he would just create his own scale and you could but do still exactly within, the, But still within this uh, system. Uh, within like, the what, system, What I'm but speaking about is like microtonal. I know, I understand. Um, Coming there, um, like what I do, for example, mostly when, when you when you look at my like tracks, that I would like just uh, maybe take one chord or just like create my own scale. Then uh, every bit um, would be a bit microtonally up or down, and like just create some kind of like weirdness in that. Yeah. Because this is not the only system. For example, when you look at the classical Turkish music. And when you look at the when you look at the Western music, so between C and D, as much as I know now in the classical Turkish music, mm. um, in Western music this is divided by a half step, right? Yeah. So half step here, half step here, and this is a whole step. This in Turkish classical music system would be divided in nine. Oh, okay. And you would have four different sharps on the first yeah. division, fourth, fifth, and eighth. Yeah. Or when you, when you like, um, so basically the polyphonic music doesn't mean that it's more uh, developed. Mm. Uh, it's just like uh, in this culture in Europe um, or in Western culture, um, we kept it with the 12 notes because it would make us. Um, so basically, when you go when you go vertically, when you go when you go on the chords. Mm. The permutations would be somehow um, possible to have an overview of. Yeah. But if you have like five different uh, pitches between that, to combine them is like a massive uh, combination. So, the, for example, other cultures, the music would, uh, would be more developed in the, in the horizontal way, mm -hmm. which is like how the melody works, how the melody goes. But um, they then it would be too complicated, like it would be too much computing for the mind yeah. to think of um, think of the fitting um, sound, uh, f fitting note uh, if it's somewhere right between those. Mm -hmm. So this is how the how the Western music uh, system just developed, just like in the painting yeah. that. Um, between Renaissance, you would have no perspective in the paintings, so everything would be a bit like flat. Yeah. And then from Renaissance on, you would have like the 3D feeling in the paintings. So this is exactly what harmony is or polyphony is. Yeah. Well, for example, like um, 
whatever like AFX twin, let's talk like if you if you take AFX twin for example, what he would do is just like um, really creating a really simple, simple almost like silly melody, mm -hmm. and then he would just change the fine tuning of every every note mm. to somewhere differently. Yeah. And that you would get this really like weird feeling like this is for example like one of his signatures even more than no. his his breakbeat stuff. Yeah, I often have a similar effect mm -hmm. depending on a synth when you uh, activate the glide function, and then it exactly. takes it takes mm -hmm. a while for a note to uh, like for example play play the C and then this C mm -hmm. would be uh, uh, it would take an extra long time until it transitions due to the glide function and this mm -hmm. way you can also have some mm -hmm. very uh, uh, interesting detuning effects, I think, especially on the MOOC synthesizers, often works really, really nice. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So this is basically like, at, um, so this is where I start when I'm teaching. So like just, um, then we start like what is, um, okay, this is your, this is that, but what is this? And how does it, I know what chords I'm, I'm playing right now, and this mm -hmm. is the this is the idea of like the um, the what the student would come within like a certain amount of time. Yeah. Just like um, they can sit and they can play and they can they know actually what they want. Yeah. And no one should be really scared of the music theory. It's like actually once you get the ground logic of it, it gives you so much uh, new possibilities and. It would feel like you had a problem with your eyes, and all of a sudden you put a yeah. glasses yeah. on, and you realize that how uh, yeah. how bad you were seeing. So that's basically all right. And um, yeah, for people that are interested in actually taking uh, classes from you, you mm -hmm. do them uh, in person here in Berlin, but also I do in person online. in Berlin, also online, um, um, and they can just um, drop me a mail or. DM also on Instagram, I think. Um, yeah, Instagram. Yeah. So we are going to uh, yeah link the contact infos in the description of the video. Mm -hmm. Anyways, thanks a lot for coming by, and yeah. um, we're going to see you again soon. And when we are going to uh, take a look at your um, more techno-focused live set with your electron machines. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, stay tuned for that, and thanks for tuning in. Peace out. Mm -hmm.